Now, for me, it's a real honor to be here because I'm one of your most loyal customers, probably, one of the most loyal customers on your mailing list, and I'm absolutely delighted to be able to share some time with you and share some of my knowledge, which aims to decide what we could call the neuro-friendly manager. So it's a bit like a neuro-friendly partner uh, and your neuro-friendly friend. And so today, cognitive sciences and neurosciences help us to decide what human beings really are. Until presently, who had decided on what human beings were? Well, it was theology, philosophy, all of the different uh, types of coaching, personal development that people can have. And what I mean by that is that it was a form of ideology. You had an idea what human beings should be like, the ideal human being. The problem with that was that uh, when you're there in front of people in a company or in a school, I'm talking about competitors, not you, and when you count 10 people who are coming into work, and out of 10, you've got eight of them that are lacking in motivation. I don't say that. It's the Gallup Institute that carries out surveys. Eight out of 10 people are lacking in motivation. When you drop your children off at school, out of 10, eight of them are lacking in motivation. And who could blame them? Because... The challenge here today is to try and understand that in order to motivate people, there is a favorable way of doing it. There's something that we can develop, not via ideology, but via observing human beings. And so what I'd like to see with you is... As people, human beings, what makes us a special animal? What characterizes us? What makes us unique? And there are three characteristics, and you'll see they're very simple. The first one is that the human brain is the only brain in nature that has procrastinated in terms of development. We're not in a hurry. We're in no hurry to finish the work. I like to compare a human brain with the Salada Familia because it's a huge cathedral with lots of cranes all the time. And so when you're 20, 30, 40, 90 years old, your brain should still be surrounded by cranes that are doing the job. And you'd be like Jean Dambisson, Michel Serre, Edgar Morin, you know, all of those young, old people. Because thanks to this virtue, the human brain is still developing. And with our brains, we can stay young. And in the brain, there is sort of a fountain of youth. I'm going to show you a video here. If you have a look at a brain cell that is only four weeks old, which has been taken from a man who was 49, and you can see this brain cell traveling around in the brain. And my first point I'd like to make here is to say that the human brain is quite particular because it's the only part of the human body which seems to escape time. And what's going to motivate it to develop then? Well, quite simply, change. The brain is a little bit like a Swiss army knife and it can find all sorts of solutions to the problems that you might have, problems that you're faced with every day. Now, I'm happy because I'm speaking to managers today. You've got problems to solve every day. And I'm delighted because this is going to help you and it's going to enable you to keep a really good brain in full health. The brain is nourished by change and it's destroyed by routine. On one condition, however, that when I receive information, new information, I've got to be able to understand it so I can act. And the theme today concerns action. And so you're going to understand that action is what makes us free, it sets us free as long as you have the information. So always think that when you're going to give someone information, give that person time to go from knowledge to understanding, and then after that, you've got to act. That's the first point, because the human brain is always becoming something else. Uh, now, when you see a horse when it's born, in 20 minutes, that little horse is able to move already and to follow the rest of the herd. So it doesn't need to go to school. It doesn't need to follow training like you're having today with inspiring conferences, with a book that you've just read, or because uh, you've just been watching TEDx, for example. Because you have received that new information, you have already developed new skills. And the human brain is an organ which is going to develop talent in accordance with the information that it receives. And 
You don't, you're not born a human, you become a human being. And that's the idea that each time you're going to feel the impact of new information, a conference, a book, somebody who explains something to you, then you're going to be transformed. And that's the first point. The second point consists of seeing the human brain a little bit like a, a part of the body that you can split into. And so, on the one side, you've got the blue part here. You can eat peanuts, you can watch a football match, and you can sleep well. But if next to me there's somebody who's hurt themselves, and I can hear them shouting, saying, oh, my finger, oh, my finger, I'll turn around, and if I see that they've got a nail stuck in their finger, then I will feel that pain in my finger too. Because there's another brain to which I don't have any access, but which works via other people, via the corpus of other people via their bodies and that's what I'm going to call the social brain. I've got a brain which I have no control but it is permanently trying to be introduced into other people's bodies and it lives experiences via other people. And so you can see that it's a form of empathy, it's the support for empathy, and it's the brain that's continually trying to find out how people live from an emotional point of view, what their intentions are, what motivates them in life. And in actual fact, when I receive that type of information, which feeds into this red part of the brain that we call empathy, as I said, a brain that is informed, at the end of the day, has got to take action. So what does a brain do that receives information via this red channel here? Well, that triggers behavior, which is going to be facing the expectations that comes from other people, which is called sympathy. So empathy, I receive information. Sympathy, I focus my behavior towards others, but not for myself. Now, just one thing here, which you have to remember about this, when you ask people, and we've done this, when you ask people to wear a headset full of sensors so we can measure their brain movement, and with Bluetooth you can see what's happening throughout a whole day, you have to realize that 30%, only 30% of your mental activity corresponds to the satisfaction and fulfilling your own needs. 70% concerns other people. So, do you realize how human beings are a social species, and that's, there's no other species that's capable of living via other people's bodies? And that's the reason why when you're faced with someone, you're in front of someone, if that person yawns three times, then on the fourth time, you'll yawn too. And so, your brain takes the other person as if it was himself. And so there are a few attributes here. I'll come back to this idea of collective intelligence because we don't live in an ideal world. This red brain that takes other people's points of view is going to do it on condition that the other person is sharing certain characteristics as well. Like, for example, values, a standard or a norm. And so we'll come back to that notion later on and you'll be encouraged to feel empathy towards other people, to feel emotions, affection, and even a cognitive link to other people in terms of our desire, because this part of our brain is going to recognize in other people part of himself. You know, it's not as generous as all that, really. It's just because there's that illusion that makes you think that you see yourself in other people. And then the third and last characteristic concerns the brain, I remind you, is a part of the body which is going to trigger action. But human beings have another characteristic, which is that this action that we're going to trigger, we can do it on the basis of three presents. So there's the present of the past, which means that we're able, if we've got a problem, which we have to act upon, it enables us to bring up past experiences. So we delve into our memory. Do you remember two months ago, you already had that problem, and so there's no point in re inventing the wheel, you'll look for that solution in your memory and you'll remember what you did in the past and you'll remember that that was valid at the time. So you can take the past, put it in the present so that you can find a solution. And we're all capable of doing that, but we're not the only ones. If you've got a dog and if you've trained it, it's capable of showing you 
that it can also change its behavior as well. So, for example, if at the back it says, I'm going to jump on the settee, and the head says, no, 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 don't do it, because I know what happens. I know what's going to happen when we find ourselves on that settee. So changing behavior on the basis of a past experience isn't something that we're the only ones to can do, but we do do it. The second condition for action is the present, what we're experiencing now. Now, what is the mode of being in the present? It's uh, with regards to our emotions, our affections. And uh, the root of that uh, means what pushes me forward to take action. So when we're living in the present, and that's why I came here, it's so that you can produce emotion. And that's why the digital world, which delves us into the world of the present, is a world or a universe where you've only got thumbs that are going up or down. It's either you like or you don't. It's smileys, it, it, only emotions. And the world of the present is the world of emotions. And if you've got a dog and you've walked on his tail, he will also show you that he has emotions too. And he'll act straight away in accordance with those emotions. But if I come to the third point, the only thing about human beings is that we're able to act not with regards to the past or measuring the emotions now where we have to choose between A, B or C or D, if I'm in the present, I'm going to choose an option that gives me the most pleasure. Human beings have a third aspect as well, and that's what we call the present in the future. So with what we call our frontal lobe, we're able to imagine a future, a desirable future. And Given the time it is, if you were in Magritte's seat here, Magritte is a painter, an artist looking at an egg, but he's painting the future of that egg. Now, what would you do if you were in his shoes? I've identified uh, some people here in the room who might see some uh, omelets because it's time for lunch. Human beings are the only animals that are able to escape from the dictatorship of the present and build a future that they would like, and that's called desire. And so in other terms, human beings are the animals that bear desire. Animals have needs, human beings have desires. And if you combine that third specificity, human beings are able to take action based on a wishable or desirable future, they can even have a simulation of a future reward as well. And so they'll say, I'm not going to eat that apple, but I can imagine because that's what I imagine I'm going to have in the future. And so if you combine this idea that we've got here, this capability of seeing what 2030 is going to be like and act now on the basis of your vision of 2030, then you can combine this faculty of the brain with the second one. Are you following me here? What was the second one? No. So there were three different uh, times, but we saw different characteristics in terms of the properties that we have in the human brain. So we've got a social brain. 70% of our mental activity is for other people. So if you combine this second and third characteristic, and you will have understood what CSR is because the human brain is capable of changing its configuration so they can think of a desirable future, but a future that can be shared, the sociable future. So you see, because we can't imagine that we're on our own on an island uh, with Coca-Cola and uh, gold all around us, we imagine ourselves with people who we love, even with people who we love who might not be with us either in the future. And that's what human beings do. We have that capability of acting on the basis of those three different times and our capabilities. Okay, so let's have a look at this in more detail. So this is the, the revolution of the 20th century in cognitive science. I'm sure you've seen this before. It was a whole tsunami for two years. I worked with the Minister for Education, Mr. Blanquer, in France, because the challenges with regards to management are exactly the same in terms of education. What I mean by that is we are all exploded, inundated with information. And the real revolution is that either you follow that uh, ideological current uh, or you listen to what science is saying without any prejudgment at all, but just in an empirical way, you say, how does a brain work? And so today, each of these different stages 
can be described and can be analyzed as well, and especially offers tools as well, which will be suitable and help you to make the right decisions, understand why some people are resistant to change, where, by, whereas others, and I can see you here, you're very optimistic, and uh, I can see that you see change as an opportunity. And so all of these arrows here across the top can be described. And I'm going to go over this very quickly. But the first one, for example, consists in seeing via the exchange of information, so for example, when you gather together the people that you work with, how have you got to work so that what you're going to pass across as information uh, doesn't miss the target? And most of the time, maybe not here, but in a lot of other organizations, uh, we spend our time in meetings and there's no real transformation in terms of behavior. And so I'm going to give you the keys to success here. There are six main pillars that you can use so that when you have a meeting, you can make sure that you have the strongest impact possible and that you can help people and enable them to change in their behavior. Six pillars which will enable this arrow to go straight to the brain and that it won't just be a little bit like water on a duck's back. So first one, first pillar. Now, there's a problem here is that the people here have got to be actively engaged. And that's not just uh, something I woke up thinking and I thought, you know, when you give lectures, uh, your audience has got to be very active. No, that's not something that you can't decree, but it's something that you can measure. And so this is an experience, an experiment that was carried out. I had a group where I asked them to look at a screen and every 15 minutes, a list of words appeared on the screen. And every 15 minutes, we repeated the experience, the experiment. Group B, group B, where we substituted two phases of learning with test phases. So we say, oh, do you remember something? Tell me what you remember. So you can see, you do that twice. And then group C is the Corsican group, because they're going to work the least, because there'll be as many learning phases as there are test phases. So nice and easy. So they'll work four times whereas at the top they would have worked eight times. And the result of all of this is if you go and question everyone afterwards, 48 hours later, if you have had a meeting and you say to people, OK, are there any questions? And if no one asks any questions, then you can leave your meeting and go and take a Prozac. Because zero questions means that only 16% of what have been said is going to be remembered. You've wasted your time. You could have maybe spent 10 minutes instead of an hour. 16% of what you said will be remembered. However, if there are two questions over a phase of six learning phases, then you double that. So can you imagine the advantages of questioning people? If there's a real active commitment of the person who's listening, attending the meeting, who's going to learn, and you can see it's even proportional. The more questions you have, uh, then the better you will remember what was said. It's scientific, it can be measured, it can be quantified, and you can reproduce it. You can do it whatever the cultures may be, everybody is the same. Doesn't matter who's in the meeting with you. Second pillar. Now, why is active commitment and engagement so important? Because when you ask questions, this is my second pillar here, when you ask questions, you'll have the possibility to do what we call uh, feedback with regards to that information. So to show someone that they made a mistake, and you know that in terms of learning and in terms of change management, the hardest thing is to know what you don't know, and so by asking someone, OK, do you know that you know that now? And do you know that you don't know that now? So that sort of metacognition, so the brain looks at itself and says, yes, I know that, but I didn't know that. That's the object of the subjective of motivation because it's linked to your target. And don't be pessimistic because sometimes in questions, people find answers. And that's 
when you get a reward. 30% of your brain works in accordance with satisfying your needs. So if I say to someone, okay, I'm going to give you a bonus, that's good, but I'm only talking to 30% of the brain. If at the same time I hug the person and say, oh, you know, that effort was amazing, you've succeeded in doing something that no one else has, then I'm playing on their social recognition, and then it's 70% of the brain that is listening rather than 30%. So that return on information can play on both aspects, motivation and reward. Third pillar that you're going to have to look after when you're going to be in meetings with people, you've got to pay attention. You have got to choose where the audience should look and where the audience should be remembering things. We're not able to multitask. So you know the game of bento, so I'm going to start the video and I'm going to ask you to look and see where the coin is, okay? So you've got the coin here, up until there it's dead easy, dead easy, and now we'll get started. And then all of a sudden I'll stop the film and I'm going to ask you to give me the position of that coin. Okay, I'm going to stop. Uh, okay, if I stop here, for example. You think everyone agrees it's the position A3 under the hand? Okay, you'll see. Let's have a look. Okay, oh, you're good in Decathlon, really. Did you see a squirrel go past? Did you see a squirrel go past? Did you see a green pepper? Ah, red. Okay. Now, if I put this in the center. Okay, now you don't know where the coin is. And look at what you missed. It's going to come on the bottom left. Have a look at the bottom left of the screen. Hang on, I'll put it up again. Having given you the information, the recommendation to know where the coin is, your brain received information. And I wanted to make sure that I could uh, do something with this green pepper, because I asked you to follow the goblet where you would find the coin. And so your brain, because there are no rebels here, I don't think, followed the recommendation and instruction and did away with anything else. And so said, OK, I'm going to focus my attention on the red goblets, because you knew that you had to follow the coin. And so when you stop the video, everybody's able to say where the coin is, because you followed the red goblets. But if I say to two people, and one is a rebel and refuses to follow the instructions, just sits here dreaming, he will have seen that green pepper because it's the only thing that changed in this scene where it was always the same thing being repeated. So, one, you've just seen how collective intelligence is all the same if you're all trained in the same way. So, if you recruit people all from the same schools, maybe we'll talk about this later, it's better to have people who've got different strategies, come from different fields, and you'll see that uh, the human brain can't do too many things. So if you accept the instruction, then you accept that maybe there is something else going on, something else in addition to the red goblets, and you accept that, and if somebody says there's a green pepper, I don't have any regrets, because that's the price to pay. And I'm cutting this short, but this is what we call uh, saving your attention, and Amazon uses this, and Netflix as well. And that's why if you say, OK, I'm going to go to bed, it's about 11 o'clock, but then at 3 o'clock in the morning, you're still in front of the telly because there's that uh, economy of attention which is based on this type of work. So it's up to you to choose. When you are giving information in a meeting, it's up to you to hire, give a hierarchy to it, prioritize, because not everything will be understood. Fourth pillar, consolidation. Now, don't hope that you're going to change people just by saying things once. And that's 
a mistake that we all make as managers, as parents. We say, but no, I've already told you that. Well, it's not sufficient. It's not sufficient because it's only by repetition that uh, we're going to be able to obtain change in behavior. And the best tool that you can give people if you want to change them in this consolidation phase is to teach them how to self-assess, because as soon as you start self-assessing, then you repeat things. Fifth pillar, when I want to get into somebody's brain, you know, you mustn't always want to enter using their IQ, because their IQ is one of the eight doors that will take you into someone's brain. So when I start thinking about logic or mathematics, that's what we use, we measure with IQ, that can be good with some people, but you might realize if you've got a social brain that you're talking to someone and for five minutes, you know, they haven't been listening, you've lost them. And then if you take... Uh, a whiteboard and felt pen and you draw something, then you can take them on board, you can take them on a journey. Because for that person, the most powerful doorway, which is going to enable you to enter his or her brain, is going to be the visuospatial method, because a drawing would be so much better for that person than something that sounds rational. Now, Maybe this isn't good news for you, but uh, I'm going to give you a book which will enable you to go further. I'm here to light the fire, but then after that, you're going to do that work at home. So we're going to be giving you some books. There are two key books. I'll give the titles to Manu. They're easy to read, but they're important, and they'll help you with regards to multiple intelligence, multiple forms of intelligence in human beings. And then the sixth pillar that you have got to use if you want to get information across, and this is what I'm trying to do with you today, is if you've got really important information, or maybe it's because you've got important information, you really have to be very careful about the way in which you try and get them across. Use the right vector, use emotions, because you know how long that we've known that you can transform behavior using emotions? Since Pavlov. Pavlov was able to prove that by shaking a bell, if at the same time he held out a bowl with meat, the dog would make the effort to then want to eat with a bell. If you're not a good manager, but there aren't people like that here, all of the bad ones have probably stayed at home or with the competition, if you shake your bell, you can shake it louder and louder, but if at the same time you're handing out or holding out a bowl with bits of polystyrene and nails, then you can shake until your, el your arm breaks, but you'll never teach anyone anything. But you can see that probably the biggest obstacle in terms of transformation in educational science is boredom. Boredom is defined as being an absence of emotion. So think you know, I put this in sixth place, but I could have put it first, really. So when you've got something that's really important to say, and when it's something that deserves a bit of intellectual concentration and thought, you have to realize that you're going to have to take care of the channel with which you try and get this information across. Now, once you have got all of this information across, and you think that you can go back to work, and that you have freed everyone, it's not finished. It's not over yet. Receiving information is perception, and that automatically gives you knowledge. I'm not going to talk about that too long. There's not that much for me to say about knowledge either, because it automatically comes from when you've received information. But you've got a role to play here, a key one. It's fundamental. You've got to help people so that they can understand. Now, if you don't understand the difference between knowledge and understanding, Understanding, it's like the difference between uh, being in front of BFM on the television or Arte, which are two television channels. And here I'm in Decathlon. Here I've taken the optimized uh, channels. So anyone who can act will act because they've understood. Now, unfortunately, this is very idealistic because the behavior that we can very often see on a daily basis is a behavior which is triggered by knowledge. And it, then people listen to uh, theories uh, about minorities and as if people were plotting against them and 
for organizations that are trying to structure themselves when you have to follow recommendations so that you can act, you'll have people who are going to act only on the basis of uh, knowledge. When we look at people's brains after occupational accidents, mainly the reason is knowledge rather than understanding. And what I wanted to show you here is what you have to do when our brain thinks it knows something and wants to act, we say, you know, shut up for a second. And I'd like to show you that uh, this is true in the 21st century. If we want to maintain social cohesion so that democracy doesn't disappear, we've got to encourage people to go from knowledge to understanding and think about how we can use our brains. So imagine if you're sleeping on the sand with somebody you like, and in the morning you wake up and you think, okay, let's go, but you don't want to wake up because you're sleeping well. And the person says, come on, the sun's uh, rising. You open an eye and you can see that uh, the sun is just coming up over the horizon. As you want to go to sleep, what do you do? Well, you close your eye again saying, no, the sun's not getting up it's the earth that's turning. Now, the first impression is the sun's rising, that's knowledge. But if you think about it a little bit, you know Gagarin has been up into space in 1969, and he saw that the earth was round, that it turned, and I could come back to the history of humanity, which has given us the proof that shows that the earth is round and that it turns. And so we have to re be really, really wary of our own brains, because as soon as it can, our brain likes to stay with knowledge rather than understanding. And what can we do? Well, we've got to look after five factors so that a manager can take its troops on the road to move towards understanding rather than just staying with knowledge. First of all, don't ask by return email, an answer to a question that you have just sent out. So give people time, because if you want to go from knowledge to understanding, you need time to digest. So an example here. So if I show you this photo up on the screen, now alpha males had to take this test, and you can't sit on the slide here, but there was a felt tip. But as soon as the felt comes, it goes from green to orange, and the question is, give three characteristics to this face, and a mark from zero to ten for three characteristics, beauty, intelligence, and ambition. And the group was set aside in a classroom, and they saw this face, and with a name which has got nothing to do with the three characteristics. Another group saw the same face, but we changed the name, and then the third group again. And I'd just like to remind you that I am asking to have an immediate answer. So everyone had that same face, but if she was called Maria D'Angelo, 7 out of 10 for beauty. If she was called Sarah, 3 out of 10. So first consequence that you can draw from this lesson is that we are not artificial intelligence. And so when you put a cat in front of a camera, with an algorithm, and if you turn the cat around, uh, you know, upside down, green, blue, whatever, for artificial intelligence, a cat's a cat. For a human being, the beauty of a face is not only the information that you perceive via 20 square centimeters, but there's also other information that I'm going to look for elsewhere. And so what's incredible about this is this variability in terms of the way in which we analyze information. So if you send out an email to four people and they answer you automatically, don't look at the answers. Put it straight into the dustbin because the answers will depend on the context in which they are. If one of them's on the next to a swimming pool, sipping a cocktail, and somebody else is in an office and uh, next door there are people doing building work, then somebody might read your email with a red pen and the other one with a yellow pen. And so they won't have the same perception of that information. And the worst is to come. On a brain which is taking in information over a short time, well, each time I see this, you know, it makes me feel depressed. Because look, these people gave themselves the right to answer, but they don't even know her. 
Now, in terms of beauty, but even then, you're only seeing 20 square centimeters. But in terms of intelligence and ambition, if we leave you one minute, which is interesting, people wouldn't answer that. But if you give them a short time, then they might say to themselves, yeah, I'll answer. You see that uh, when you use your knowledge brain, it will authorize you to answer questions where you don't have an answer, but you've just invented it. Do you see? Now, Maria, if you take her out into town to restaurants, uh, and you say, open your buttons because everyone will love your chest, uh, but as soon as there's a question uh, around the table, you'd give her a kick and say, you know, don't answer. Can you see how that brain is so awful when you ask it to manage data in real time? Now, attention, we saw that with our green pepper. Third factor, when we have an excess of a surplus of certitude now, or certainty, when you're analyzing information, think about the repetition of that same information, and you'll know why in accordance with uh, your brain that's acting on the basis of only knowledge. So why do people have car accidents on their trip to work? It's because their brain is not trying to understand. It's just using knowledge. Now, this evening, when you go home, ask somebody to answer a question. But beforehand, uh, you ask the person to re repeat the same word, white, 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 white. And after a minute, uh, you ask what a cow drinks and... You say that the person can't think, and they've got to respond automatically, and they'll say milk. Afterwards, they'll regret it, obviously, but it's too late. Okay, so when we have so much certainty, be careful when you're a manager, because also you can have too much certainty when really you're in a foggy atmosphere. So an example of this. If you ask someone to throw a dice and to have the highest number, so double six, that's what you're aiming for, and you can film the person doing it, it'll always be the same, the person will shake, blow on them because they want to make sure that they can give it a bit of luck, and they'll throw the dice so hard that uh, you'll probably have to go and pick them up off the floor. Same dice, so two times 20 grams, you ask someone to come in, you give them the dice, but the question is different. You you say, give me the lowest number and we'll give you 50 euros, so two aces. And then you can film it because it's always the same. The person will shake, but really, really gently. And if the person could put a parachute on those dice or even put a string on the end, they would. Do you see what I mean? Because you don't have to be a Nobel Prize winner, because I don't think anyone has uh, studied the speed of the dice and the link to what results you have. Now, a friend of mine wanted to impress me because he just bought a car, and last week we went around the home houses, and he took out his remote control, he pressed on it, and his garden gate opened and then got stuck after a meter. And what did he do? He pressed again. And I said, stop, it's digital. And he said, what do you mean? And he was smiling, but he kept pressing it again so that he could try and make uh, the gate open. I mean, we all do that. When the remote control doesn't work in front of the telly, you know, we start shaking it around and it's got nothing to do with the remote control. But it's just your brain, isn't it? That in this automatic mode uh, tries to add on a bit of information, even though it doesn't really have any. And then finally, if I come back to this idea of group cohesion, be careful when you're surrounded with people who come from the same background as you, same schools as you. And it was very unfortunate for NASA in the United States. Uh, Challenger blew up in 86, seven people died, and again in 2003, same thing. So they carried out a survey, an inquiry, and the investigators started in the workshops. And they discovered, they saw black and white in the registers, that you can go and have a look at, that engineers and technicians who were building the rocket said that if you put this joint in this place, then it can lead to an explosion uh, leak because of a mechanical shock or shock due to heat. And when the managers discovered that those weak signals were there, they said, but why didn't management listen to that, take it into account? And so they brought the management committee together 
the board at the time, but uh, they asked for their CVs to start with, and uh, the investigators were very surprised. They discovered that everyone had the same. 12 people on the management committee, 12 of them came from exactly the same school or two big schools, MIT in Boston or Caltech in Los Angeles. And all the others who came into NASA, we said, oh, you know, it's nice, but you can go to the workshop. And as soon as they had information, it was, yeah, that's okay, you know, go back to the workshop, uh, we'll look after that. But what was happening when you're surrounded by people who think like you, you lose that capacity to detect and listen to all of those weak signals. So that's what you have to do so that you can go from knowledge to understanding on the basis of those five pillars. But now, as a manager, your role is to try and free people via action. In clinics, when we're faced with people who are anxious, they're depressive, when they've got chronic stress, burnout, they all have had the same problem. They receive information, they know, they're not stupid, they understand, but they're not given the means to act. Do you understand? And so, just amongst us, that's just a word of advice. If you've decided to go to bed at midnight, then don't look at your emails at quarter to midnight. Yes, if you want to see the results of the Champions League, that's okay. But if it's to know whether things are going okay at work and people are saying, okay, what should we do because we've got this problem, you should say, okay, we'll see it tomorrow. That's not true, because at four o'clock in the morning, you'll be awake again trying to find a solution to that problem, because your brain will be awake during that nocturnal phase where you should be dreaming, and every 90 minutes, you'll be going into another phase where you'll be understanding, because that process here exists in the day, but it also exists every 90 minutes or 10 minutes. That's your dream. And so you can go to bed with problems and you can wake up with a solution. But if the problems are really serious, then you'll wake up in the night as well. And you'll be hot and your heart will be beating fast. Why? Because your body will be preparing to take action. So better not to get that information if you know that you're not going to be able to act straight away or when you should. So take information only when you can act. And really, what's currently happening in humanity, because you know that we're at 7.9 people on Earth, billion people on Earth, and have a look at a site called water meters, and you have the number of emails that go around in a day, and we're at about 250 billion emails per day. And the biggest danger of humanity is the information that humanity is producing, but it's condemning us to know rather than understand. And we haven't learned at school. We haven't had managers who've taught us how we should sort what's useful and what isn't. And that's the challenge today. The leaders of the future, and that's what I was saying as an aside, people in Silicon Valley are putting their children in schools where there are no digital technologies because intellectually, I said you have to learn how to understand. Descartes was talking about being septic and Montaigne, you know, what do I know? So all of these mental functions which enable us to doubt when we receive information, that's what we've got to do permanently and say that's useful and that's not. And only focus on what's useful so that you can act. Now, in what conditions have you got to take action? Well, when there is the promise of pleasure, as I said earlier on, because action gives you emotion and that's when you're seeking pleasure, but that pleasure for human beings has got to be preceded by desire. And the proof can be seen here. And I was talking about Sicity and uh, some of our students wanted to live for five days and five nights in an apartment where they were closed in and they were going to be blind. So we asked them to contribute with us to the way in which they would equip this apartment that they were going to be locked into. And for six months on Friday evening, they received a memo to prepare them and to give them some meaning with regards to this experiment. And I wanted to show them that human beings are dominated by their sight. And it's a shame because all of our other senses are left in a vegetative 
restful state and said they're dormant. And so we said, after this experiment, we'll show you that if we stroke your arm with a feather, you're going to have shivers and you'll be able to follow three conversations at the same time. You'll be able to smell uh, things in dishes that you wouldn't have smelt before because your eyes are always open. And the proof this evening, if somebody has prepared you something to eat and they put the spoon in your mouth, if you want to extract that information that you have on your palate and on your tongue, then in order to do that, you have to close your eyes. Okay, and our brain mainly creates data that comes via our retina. And what I said to them is that they were going to discover another world because they will have been delved into this completely different state. And we prepared them. And when D-Day came, for five days they were closed into this apartment. And at the end of the experiment, I gave them a test which was really easy. And the subject put their hand in a box. And in that box, I put a target. It was a hook on which I had put little velvet strips. And when the target touched the target, there was a little noise that told them to take their finger out. And then the second beep, 10 seconds later, asked them to put their finger back on the target. And you've understood what I did in between time under the table is I turned the target. And what you can see for these little circles, these are people who couldn't see, and the white circles here are for people who could see, and they can be distinguished on a threshold by which they detect something within 15 degrees. So on a target like this, if you turn it 15 degrees, we would say, oh, it's not moved. We would swear on it. Now for them, they touched it, they took their finger out, put their finger back in, 15 degree rotation, and they said, oh, it's moved. Now, how? How did they do that? Do you have an idea? Well, you know, some think that they've got bigger fingers. No, <laughs> we measured their fingers, their fingers hadn't grown over five days. But what was interesting was to have a look at what was in their brains. The blue region that you can see here is the region which is dedicated to touch. So when you touch objects with different textures, that's where the, the information is processed in your brain. And then the yellow area, for us, is a miracle because it wasn't foreseen. Um, God or nature hadn't planned that when I touch something, that yellow region should be activated. Now, why am I saying it wasn't planned? Because what's the reason for being for that area normally in the brain? It's connected to the retina. So you've understood why they were better than us. What did they have on the end of their fingers? Eyes. And you and I, that 15 degree rotation, if we put an optical lens, we can see that it's moved. But if we don't see it, then we're not able with our finger to say that there's been a change. But in five days, they were able to hack their brains so that on the end of their fingers, they were continuing to touch because you can see the blue region that's activated. But at the same time, they had that visual image as well. It's incredible, isn't it? And it shows you that reality doesn't exist. It's the brain that represents realities, but it doesn't exist. For them, uh, the visual reality was their fingers. When they touch things, you know, they represent a shape. But you can see, therefore, that a manager is the person who will accompany this type of transformation. Six months of desire, five days of pleasure. And what we have promised, they experienced. You know, we didn't lie to them. Because if your desire is really high and then on D-Day you don't get that pleasure that you'd hoped for. Remember what I said about the desire. Desire is the mental simulation of the coming reward. And one day I want to get my capital. I want a return on investment. And so you've got a strong desire. And so your pleasure has got to be up to the same level on D-Day. And when your desire is high, and on a daily basis, the pleasure is really low. We call that frustration. High desire, low pleasure, frustration. But when the desire is high and your pleasure is zero, then it's no longer frustration, it's a burnout. There's a commitment, there's a desire with a promise of pleasure, and then when it comes to, to the end of the day, it's just not there. And so this is how you can have a mental image of all of the people who you'll bump into in the street, at work, or at home. 
I'm going to change these terms because they're a little bit like jargon. So here we try to measure the motivational satisfaction. And if you give people questionnaires in their company or in a charity, in a school, you say, do you like what you do? And do you like the things that I prepare you to eat at home? From zero to 10, people can give a score. It's easy. And then after that, there's the commitment. And, you say, and I used another term, but it was the same thing. It's desire. And you will have understood that there is a three types of behavior. Those who, for the blue, will be driven by the promise of pleasure, but the desire is low. And so they won't really overcome anything or live this, take an extra mile. Now, the Reds have projects, and you say to them, Emmanuel has bumped into someone in the staff, and he said on Friday, hey, you know, I thought maybe we should revise our thing, but, you know, have a good weekend, we'll talk about it on Monday. And so he gives someone a project. Now, that person at the weekend will think about that. On Monday, he'll bump into him and say, hey, Emmanuel, your project wasn't too bad, because he has already added three other projects onto that and three days later he comes back to see Emmanuel and you know it just keeps getting bigger and bigger it's a, a project which is just flourishing blossoming and that person is escaping because each time that person is promising a desirable future a happy future and at the end of the day on a daily basis there just isn't that return on investment and so these people we're going to have to help them so that they can move to this axis and so that they can be up here. And remember what I said earlier on, 70% social brain, 30% your brain that satisfies your needs. So, you know, don't forget the person who's complaining. Have you got a company car? You know that we changed the carpet in your office and you had a bonus in August. And it's not sufficient for changing the result here. That's part of life, but don't forget to tell, say to someone how precious they are. The boss in McDonald's was a genius because he designed that, uh, you know, worker of the month photo. We all need that recognition socially. We, I'm not going to go into any details, but we spoke about the social brain. You have to know that self-confidence comes from something that other people give us. And that's why most of our brain is waiting for messages, waiting for a behavior that other people are going to have towards you. And if you doubt in that, remember what a mountain guide said to me in Chamonix, who was training young people, and they'd already been out, you know, dozens of times onto the Mont Blanc, and then one day they were caught in a snowstorm and they analyzed the situation. They knew that they couldn't even go back. There was no choice. They had to keep going up. And there was a refuge. There was a hut about uh, three or four meters later. And uh, so they started moving forward. And unfortunately, someone was in the middle and they started shaking and they couldn't move forward. And everybody along that line stopped. And so the guide unhooked went to see him. If he'd been a bad manager, he would have shouted at him and said, oh, you're pretending we've done this dozens of times and because of you, we're probably all going to die here. So, you know, get a grip. And that's what you didn't have to do. You shouldn't do. The other option that he chose was to say, you know, unhook and put yourself up at the front there because he had realized that the person who was shaking the most was because he didn't have any self-confidence. And it wasn't by asking him to think about himself that his confidence was going to come back. And it was just by looking at him differently, saying, I trust you. You're, you've got no confidence, but I'm going to fill that reservoir again and because of my attitude with regards to you. And in terms of time, how are we doing? I finished my introduction. Okay, 10 minutes left. So, just remember that our behavior is managed by those three dimensions, the promise of pleasure, and those who don't have a project because desire is a synonym of objective or project. And so if you don't have that, then you're going to have a behavior which will only be triggered by that short circuit there. Do you see? So what's the reason why you would have pleasure? It's because the behavior that you've just triggered is good for you. And you've got to start again. And so if you, you know, it's a bit like dopamine. If we look at this from a chemical point of view, you know, if you take a piece of chocolate, you've got that dopamine that tells you, oh, that was good, do it again. 
But you see that there's a problem because those who are going to live only short term without thinking ahead, they'll see their behavior becoming more and more compulsive. They can't wait anymore. You sent me an email, but you didn't answer. And I sent you an email and you didn't answer. Well, yeah, how long ago? Well, 10 minutes. Well, you know, he's toxic. You've got to do something with him because he's on that short circuit, that small loop. And when you're in that small loop, that cycle here disappears. And you can understand why. You can understand why we say that people are lacking in motivation. I didn't say so, but I was thinking that motivation is here. Motivation is the strength that you're going to use so that you can get new information. And so what have I got to do to motivate people? So that they can take that information. Well, you've got three dimensions in motivation. You've got autonomy. Somebody who's in a new job, whenever he's got something new that comes in, he calls someone to say, hey, boss, can I take a book? Can I buy a pencil? You know, that'll never work. And the motivation will disappear. Secondly, it's expertise, skills. If I ask someone to take information which isn't within his capabilities, then the motivation will disappear. Here, we're talking about windows of opportunity in terms of expertise. If you ask someone to do something that's too hard or too simple, then the motivation will disappear. And then finally, in order to keep someone motivated, the third part is the purpose. Or we could call it, you know, the meaning, if you like. That's the purpose. Okay. So motivation, so that you can keep people motivated, you've got to be independent, an expert of what you're doing, and you've got to understand the project, and you've got to understand the objective and the desire. And so people who are going to have behavior which is based only on the promise of pleasure and on an immediate return on investment, they're going to have behavior which is no longer going to be triggered by this. And so they keep coming back to the beginning where we said that eight out of ten people are lacking in motivation because they're living in what we call the present. Everything has got to be here and now, right away. And so I'd invite you to watch a video called The Marshmallow Experiment. And it's a child in front of a plate on which we've put a little cake or a marshmallow. And uh, I'll tell you the story afterwards if you'd like to, but it's very interesting. And in order to break this loop, because people are lacking motivation, then desire has got to come before pleasure. And desire is serotonin. Serotonin, which is going to break that loop. And when somebody doesn't have a project, when they're suffering mentally, because they're depressed, then we give them Prozac, which is artificial serotonin. In the next few minutes that remain, I'd like to talk to you about this idea that there is a coexistence between our red brain, which is for others, and the blue brain that you keep for yourself. And I'd like to give you a few rules very quickly about how we can organize and work and live together. In nature, if you have a look here, you've got the weight of animals along the bottom. And on the straight line, the red line, you can see that you've got a, a ratio, which means that once you've caught an animal, you put it on a scale and you can predict what the size of its brain will be because it's always proportional. But if you take human beings, we are the animals that are going to move the furthest away from that straight line. And so if you take the average weight of a man, it would be 75 kilos. 75 kilos. And that means that nature had planned to give us a brain that weighs 400 grams. That's the logarithmic here, so 75, and that gives you 400 grams. However, if you look at our, the weight of our brain, it's here. The human brain weighs one and a half kilos. So, I'll ask you that question. How come we have got more grey matter than you would have thought? Because it's developing, it's growing, but why? To do what? What's the difference here? Why have we got more grey matter? Why did we get a bonus? 
Well, because the brain that stays on the red line is the brain of somebody who's selfish. And so with 400 grams, I can take selfies all day. And I can eat peanuts as soon as I see a little plate with peanuts on them. But with that additional weight, with the kilo, do you see my rule there of the 30 and 70 percent? With a one kilo, additional kilo, then I'm ready to work for others. And that's what I mean by a social brain. And where does it come from? Now, here, this is the Neanderthal man, if you're an engineer, if you follow specifications, build on the earth an, an animal that can walk around on two legs and that could be intelligent and adapt, and you would have been able to build this animal here. Bigger brain than us, bigger bones than ours, muscles that are bigger than ours, and an Im immunity system which is so robust uh, they never caught COVID, never caught the flu, uh, never had any problems with their teeth. But if you look here, maybe women saw it more easily, that if we compare the skeleton between Neanderthal man and us, there's something that should strike you. And what's that? Ah, our hips. Now, you can see what happened here, because we were supposed to be bipeds and walk all day. If you stay standing with hips like this, then unfortunately all of your other body parts will descend, they'll go down. So our hips have become smaller, which means that mummy Neanderthal had babies which had brains that were the size of adults, a little bit like a horse, like baby horses. Baby Neanderthals didn't have to go to school, they knew everything when they were born. Now for us, we have babies, we give birth to babies that are not finished, you know, they're really handicapped when they're born. And it's an opportunity to build a brain, not because we're going to pass things on genetically from mum and dad, that's only 10%, but because of all of the information that you're going to be given when you're going to work, when you're going to be uh, reading, going to see films, uh, TEDx, etc. And so you can see that because we're going to be giving birth to a brain that's got to remain small at birth, it gives the opportunity to develop later on while we're alive. And there's nothing genetic in that, there's nothing determined. And so that's what it gives. As a result, here you've got relations with uh, early social brains, but I know that in this company you have uh, you know, avoided this. There are two problems, two traps here that you can fall into. Two, they're ignored because they're being given care, so we're not inclusive. And secondly, the relationship with each other is a relationship which is based on hierarchy. There's somebody that dominates and there's somebody who is being dominated. And we've decided to have this instead. Now, behind this phone, you haven't only got two people. You've got hundreds of people. It's infinite. And you'll always have more and more contacts and more and more people with whom you're going to be able to exchange things. And secondly, behind these contacts, there's a real appetite to meet other people on a principle of equality because there's no hierarchy. Now, I know I'm a little bit behind, so let me conclude. And this is the result of our social brain. Now, you know why I take a lot of examples using football. And for those of you who are good, you would have uh, recognized the team. But here you've got a player who put his hands on his head. 40,000 uh, spectators with their hands on their heads as well. But if you look at this picture, there are two that haven't, him and him. And why? Because they're wearing yellow jerseys. And so they are not inclusive. They don't belong. And so their social brain could be plugged into the other person, but only if the other person shares my values, my standards, my norms. In sport, it's easy. There are logos, there are colors. But what brings us here together is the logo for Decathlon, isn't it? And so it's that idea that the social brain is nourished because we see and meet others, but only if the other person shares my values. And let's look at the last slide, because I have to conclude. A manager who is neuro-friendly has got to know whether around him he 
he's surrounded by people who have projects, who have desires, because if he doesn't have any, then his mission is going to be to pass on that desire, because desire is contagious. An example, if I ask students, I say, do you like green Haribo sweets? And they put a score, 5 out of 10. If it's a yellow lemon one, it's 3 out of 10. So they leave. And then I bring in other people. And before I show them the slide with uh, the green crocodile or the yellow crocodile, I ask them to have a look at a video which is going to last five seconds. And in the first case, we film a crocodile who doesn't move from a table. It lasts four se five seconds. And then the second case, um, we've got a crocodile that we film for four seconds. It doesn't move. And in the last second, oh, somebody takes it. A hand comes in and takes it. And then you come in with your two slides. Do you like green crocodile? Crocodiles, or do you like yellow crocodiles? And uh, the green crocodile is still five, whereas the yellow crocodile is now eight out of ten. The fact that they saw a hand taking a yellow crocodile, and that's why I called this experience Experiment, your desire is mine, because naturally you can see that something that they had no appetite for has become more popular. So don't forget that our social brain produces desire and it produces a little bit for you, but also a lot for everyone else. So I'm going to conclude with this Persian proverb, which reminds us that if we have two ears and a mouth, it's so that we can listen two times more than we speak. So I'm going to stop now. Thank you for listening.